Okay, a short introduction, introduction, I guess. So my name is Art Sobolev. I work at the research at the Samsung AI Center here in Moscow. I'm a research scientist there. Uh, I guess as a member of Bayes Group, Bayesian Methods Research Group, I am also interested in Bayesian deep learning and uh, mostly interested in stochastic computation of graphs. Uh, so that's why I'll be talking about the discreteness in stochastic computation of graphs. Uh, I hope Professor Vetrov has convinced you that stochastic computation of graphs are an interesting problem, an interesting object to study. Uh, so without further ado, uh, the talk will be split in three major parts. First, I will remind you uh, the problem. Uh, we will reconsider the reinforced estimator, see why it might be not as good as uh, it might seem to be. Uh, I guess that will be mostly a repetition of what Professor Vetter sa has said. Then we'll talk about the relaxations. How can we use the power of reparameterization trick in order to uh, learn such discrete models? Uh, but then we will step back a little and try to fix the reinforce method that we introduced in the section two uh, and try to reduce its variance so that uh, it will be more efficient and uh, we'll, we will be actually able to do some learning using that. And then we'll conclude the talk. Okay, so why do we even care about discreteness? Uh, I'm pretty sure you have been given some examples already, so I'll go over this section uh, without uh, digging deep into the de details. So. Uh, there are several reasons why you might be interested in, discrete, uh, in, in discreteness in your computational graphs, in your neural networks. First of them is the interpretability. Sometimes it's easier for you to make sense of discrete category than of the continuous spectrum. For example, if you're generating, if in the VAE you're generating MNIST images or some images, then uh, there are some categorical traits of the uh, images. For example, if the, those are handwritten digits uh, or handwritten text, then uh, you might be interested to find some latent feature that corresponds to the type of the character, type of the digit. And this is inherently a discrete feature. Uh, then uh, sometimes you might be interested in manipulating the computational flow. I guess I should have used the word computational here. That is. Uh, to say that you may want to empower your network, give its ability to choose, uh, to make a discrete choice of which path, uh, which computational path to use. For example, maybe you have a network that has, that has several other networks uh, and you want to process simple images, simple objects using a simple shallow network and don't waste lots of uh, computational resources and efforts on simple objects, whereas if an object, if an image is uh, complex, then you might, you might want to uh, allow yourself bigger computational budget and process the corresponding input using a bigger neural network. Then you, what you would have is you'd have a network that would decide which of the other networks to put the image uh, through. Uh, or maybe this is just an inherent trait of the problem you are solving. Maybe you're trying to generate some discrete structures and you want these discrete structures to have certain properties. You want to somehow impose these properties on them. Uh, so y you can get some discrete structure and by running some validator, some validation function, you see whether this uh, object mm, satisfies, uh, has these properties or not. Uh, so uh, these all are examples of very specific uh, problems. For example, when you care about interpretability, you might be looking for the discrete variation of other encoder that assumes that the latent code, or at least the part of the latent code, is, is discrete and uh, is encoded by, like, say, categorical uh, random variables. Mm. Or if you willing to, if you want to give your model an opportunity to make discrete choices, to uh, discreetly uh, select which part of the uh, downstream pipeline to use. Uh, you might be looking for, uh, you could, could be looking for the hard attention, where uh, instead of a soft attention, you don't wait every single image patch, every single input using uh, 
some non-negative probability, but instead make the hard choice, the binary choice of whether to take something or discard completely. That might save you some computation if you are able to organize the computation efficiently. Uh, and then uh, on the uh, then there uh, there are GANs for text. GANs have proven to be a very powerful model for images and maybe some other natural signals, uh, but so far they haven't been as successful for uh, texts for discrete objects, and uh, that might be in part due to the fact that it's hard to differentiate through discreteness. In GANs, you have this adversarial game between the generator and discriminator, and you need to backpropagate through discriminator to generator to learn the later. Okay, so uh, that's it for the introduction. Uh, I hope uh, this mm, th that you are convinced that uh, since these problems exist, uh, there is some need for discrete uh, for methods that can we can work with discrete latent variables in stochastic stochastic computational graphs. So, from a mathematical point of view, the problem can be formulated as following. So, all these problems that we discussed so far, they can be, they essentially fall into the general framework that looks, that can be written as following. So, uh, we have some z that is discrete, but of course we cannot solve the discrete, we do not want to solve the discrete optimization problem uh, in the first place. We only care about the continuous optimization. So what we do instead is that we take these discrete samples and uh, discrete things and say that they are actually coming from some distribution Q that is parameterized by parameters phi, uh, by parameters phi. and we we, t we take these samples, we put them into the function f, and we average out all the values of f over the different samples Q, uh, z from the Q. Th this would be our objective. Uh, here we would be maximizing it instead of minimizing losses as usual, but uh, I guess this is a common theme for Bayesian deep learning. Mm. Now, we, as usual, we will assume that uh, there exists some gradient of the uh, thing we will try to maximize, because otherwise uh, all we could really hope for is a kind of some kind of a random search, which is not really efficient. So we assume that there exists the gradient of this function. Uh, of course, uh, that does not help us much because, okay, even if it exists, uh, we cannot efficiently compute it because we cannot efficiently evaluate this expectation. So what do we do? Well, we already know about the stochastic optimization. So what instead we need is we need an unbiased estimate of this true gradient. This unbiased estimate I will denote as g of z and phi. And the, its unbiasedness need, means that if you average this estimate over many different samples, then you will recover the true gradient. Uh, so, however, in the previous talk, uh, the the major uh, the major source of the uh, the major enabler of this uh, gradient-based learning was the reparameterization trick that allowed you to sort of uh, interchange the differenti differentiation and the expectation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, even though you could reparameterize the mm, discrete, discrete, variab discrete random variables in such a way, it's not possible to, to come up with a continuous, with a differenti differentiable reparameterization trick for Z. Uh, and th this is due to the simple fact that Z is taking finitely many different values. It's therefore cannot be differentiated. So what can we do then? Well, you are already presented with the so-called log derivative trick that leads to the so-called reinforced estimator. Uh, and it has this simple form where you just take a bunch of samples from your distribution, you evaluate each sample at the, at the point, uh, you evaluate your function f at each point, you multiply this f by the gradient of log density of the corresponding sample, and you average uh, these things over uh, your mini batch. Yeah, that's nice because, uh, uh, as you can see, 
here this greatness of z does not get into the way uh, it does not prevent us from anything uh, even f is not required to be continuous uh, which from one on the one, one hand it's this is a nice property uh, because th this means that the estimator is more general but then in all our problems f will usually be the next part of the pipeline that will be differentiable and we would really like to leverage such um, luxury so yeah uh, as you have been already told typically this reinforced estimate has impractically large variance so in practice you really can do anything with uh, just the reinforced estimate you would need some variance reduction techniques uh, and these well you could say okay let's just take bigger m uh, capital the more samples we have the smaller the variance is that is definitely true however you can achieve roughly the same by just running your stochastic optimization for a longer period of time so um, that's not gonna help us much uh, besides the reduction in variance by increasing m is sublinear so uh, we would definitely like something more efficient than that uh, the what people actually do is they use baselines and control variates, but uh, we will leave that for later. Uh, let's f now uh, reiterate why reinforce is bad and uh, dissect it and try to um, better understand what are its weakness so we can uh, so we know what to look for. So if you take B capital M from this slide to be one, take just one sample. Uh, what that's what people quite often do. Uh, you will see that the reinforced estimator is has this simple form, and here, we, we, yeah, we assume here that the phi is a vector, so the gradient is the vector, and uh, here we have scalar times the vector. So first, let's recall what the gradient is. If you are standing at some point in the high dimensional space and you know the gradient, essentially what the gradient says you is that it tells you the gradient tells you the direction where you should go in order to locally maximize locally improve your value of the function uh, roughly the same applies to the stochastic estimate is except that this direction uh, it gives you it would give you direction only in average so what does this estimate say yes where should we go so this estimate says, says that so the direction in this gradient comes only from this term and this is just a mu multiplicative scaling factor so the essentially if we are following this gradient we would be maximizing this quantity uh, proportional to sort of th this term and that means that Uh, th th that essentially means that we are maximizing log probability of our of the given sample, uh, which kind of sounds weird. And the only way f itself, the function that uh, uh, we kind of trying to maximize, enters this expression is through its value at the given point. So uh, essentially, we are uh, maximizing the probability of a given sample if it happened to be good. And uh, for example, if f turned out to be negative, then we would go into the, uh, into, the neg into the opposite direction, saying that, OK, this sample turned out to be bad. We don't want to have it anymore. Uh, now, what's troubling, as was already pointed out, is that we don't use any gradient information of f. And uh, surely, uh, I'm sure you are told that having gradient information greatly uh, helps your optimization. It al allows you to perform much more efficient optimization. Uh, so I guess if we were using the gradient of f, that would really help us. Because at each point, we would know where should we go uh, in terms of uh, maximizing the f rather than uh, increasing probability of samples that turned out to be good. So th this is what I mean by uh, the reinforce has no idea where to move mass systematically. Uh, so all in all, it turns out that the reinforce is actually a random search in disguise. It pretends to be a gradient method, but the only gradient it uses is the gradient of the log probability, and we are kind of maximizing the f of the uh, of this of the of z. Uh, 
So uh, in the real uh, gradient method, uh, the gradient of f should also be used uh, in some sense. And uh, as Professor Vetrov has told you, the, reinfor uh, the reparameterization trick does that. Uh, so th this is uh, the major source of uh, problems of reinforce, that uh, the source of high variance is due to the fact that we are not using the gradient of uh, our function f. Uh, moreover, consider the case where f is always not negative or uh, always positive or always negative, then every point, for, for example, for always positive f, uh, no, no matter how bad the z was, we will try to maximize its uh, probability. That is, we will try to make more of that. And it's only by averaging a lot of z, uh, even those that are good, uh, we will recover the good gradient, the true gradient of the expression we are trying to optimize. So that justifies the need for contravariates for variance reduction methods. Okay. So uh, now that we figured out uh, what's the problem of the reinforce, uh, and we know that there is no reparameterization, no continuous differentiable reparameterization for uh, discrete random variables, uh, let's maybe try to come up with something continuous, something differentiable, but hopefully not far away from the discrete case. And this is what we'll be doing in uh, the relaxation section. Uh, and the idea is the following. So uh, it's only th during the training where we, we need the gradients, we have these difficulties with discreteness. So maybe we can relax our discreteness during the training stage, replace our discreteness with something. Yeah, there should be a wave here as well. Uh, we replace our discrete z's, z's with, z's with the relaxed ones, the ones with the wave on, on top of that. And then we reparameterize the continuous ones using the, uh, some kind of a reparameterization trick in order to obtain something that we can efficiently differentiate in the same way as we differentiated it in case of the VIE uh, when we were talking about Gaussian random variables. Uh, but what's important though is that at the testing stage we will still be using the discrete version of our networks, the discrete samples. Uh, so we, during the training stage, we use the relaxed samples in order to get g real gradients. And during the testing stage, we will use discrete samples in order to harness all the honey discrete samples give us. Uh, one important, uh, one important uh, thing, though, to notice is that if we would like to uh, give our model some relaxed values, then they will most likely be no longer discrete. They will be some kind of uh, uh, continuous approximation that uh, they will be having kind of a mixture uh, of, with some probability it will be one value, with a lesser probability it will be another value. So that requires our f to be able with such relaxed va variables. Uh, that's not always the case, and maybe if you have f that uh, works only with discrete objects, like maybe some external part, external program, external program, external part, like you know, a parser or a compiler that only can work with discrete uh, entities, then uh, you're out of luck and the relaxations work, work won't work for you. Uh, but in our case, we will assume that that's uh, not the problem for us. Uh, usually for us, f is uh, another neural network and it surely can work on mm, continuous random variables. So uh, in order to introduce you the relaxation methods we'll be talking about, I first need, you need to familiarize you with the old trick uh, back when neural networks were still in the cold in the, during the AI winter, people were doing graphical models and there they had this so-called Gumbel Max trick we won't need almost any properties of that. Uh, however, uh, for us it will be just a way to sample categorical random variables that we will then relax so that it will become differentiable. And the trick is as following. Suppose you have some categorical random variable z that, has, that takes on the value 1 with probability p1, value 2 with probability p2, and so on, up to the value k with probability pk. 
uh, by the way, I will here assume that the categorical random variables as numbers are kind of interchangeable with one hot vectors. Indeed, if you have some uh, categorical uh, value of k, it's uh, kind of isomorphic, it's the same as the one hot vector where all, all the components of the vector are zero and only kth component is one. So, uh, it's an interesting property of the standard exponential r random variables is that if you take a bunch of independent exponential, standard exponential random variables, Xk, and then divide each Xk by the corresponding probability Pk, then the minimum, the arg minimum of such expression, uh, well, it's another random variable because Xk is uh, random. But the arg minimum would be distributed exactly as the categorical distribution uh, has. Would be the arg minimum would have this categorical distribution. So th this is kind of one way to sample r categorical random variables. You can sample a bunch of independent exponentials, then transform them using the division, and then uh, solve the then just find the minimum. Uh, we'll massage this formula a bit l further by just applying the minus logarithm and arrive at this formulation. Uh, so th this is essentially uh, one way to reparameterize your uh, discrete random variable z, except uh, it's still, of course, non-differentiable. As I said, there is no differentiable reparameterization. Uh, the only source of the non-differentiability, though, is this argmax operator. And uh, what uh, we'll be doing right now is we'll try to relax the argmax with something differentiable. And, well, it's quite obvious what that would be. It would be just a softmax uh, with a temperature. So uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the softmax formula, and the temperature here is just dividing um, it's just the division of the arguments of the softmax by some uh, constant, by some parameter tau. Uh, yet the tau is assumed to be non-negative. So uh, what's so interesting about this uh, softmax with temperature? By controlling the temperature, you can control the sharpness of your approximation. In particular, if you take the limit of zero temperature, then you will recover the step function, the argmax function. Uh, and uh, by increasing the temperature, you will deviate further away from the argmax uh, function uh, all the way to the infinite temperature would give you a, like a uniform distribution that is completely ignorant of any disparities in the inputs. Uh, okay, so now after we having replaced uh, argmax with the softmax, we have a fully differentiable pipeline. We can differentiate our network end to end. Uh, there is, there are absolutely no points of non differentiability, and also we already have reparameterization for free. Uh, namely, what we do is we take our log probabilities, we perturb them by uh, gamma one. Uh, which is, oh yeah, by the way, I forgot to say why this trick is called Gumbel Max trick. Uh, the uh, Gumbel Max is because this thing, the minus logarithm of exponential random variable, it's called the Gumbel random variable. Uh, it doesn't matter for us, uh, specific, the specific properties of such distribution don't matter to us. It's extensively studied in the extreme value theory, but uh, those are irrelevant to us. Uh, w the only thing we care about is that we can efficiently compute it through uh, some transformations of the uniform random variable. Okay, so this is our reparameterization that is completely differentiable and uh, easy to compute. You just take your log probabilities, you perturb each probability independently by standard Gumbel noise and then push the perturb vector through the softmax with temperature. Uh, and if you want to actually sample uh, Gumbel noise, you can uh, sample it by applying minus logarithm twice to the uniform random variable. This gives us the following objective. Now, uh, as we have s s thought, uh, our objective looks as the expectation over independent noise gamma, 
and we use that noise gamma in order to uh, compute the relaxed z's uh, and put them and use them in the computation in the neural network. Uh, now the distribution over which we integrate does not depend on any parameters on phi at all. So we can easily push the gradient through the expectation and obtain such estimate for a gradient, the reparameterized re gradient. Now let's step back a little and think what we have just done. So previously we had a neural network that was generating probabilities and then sampling categorical random variables from it and passing it further to the F, uh, to the downstream part of the network. Now, instead of sampling categorical random variables, we per perturbed these probabilities, namely, uh, whereas previously you probably generated probabilities using the softmax, now in the softmax you add some noise to the inputs and then apply a temperature. The temperature is no big deal. You could easily use the temperature previously uh, in the deterministic neural network, but it's the noise that makes the difference. Uh, it's the noise that uh, ch changes, mm, th that introduces something new. So why is the noise even interesting? Well, there are several arguments for that. First, uh, I guess you were, uh, I, I hope you are already converted into the Bayesianism and you believe into uh, Bayesian inference. I really hope so. So th this procedure then uh, is kind of rooted in the Bayesian inference. Uh, which is nice, uh, but then on the practical point of view, we know that noise helps uh, the model to regularize because it makes the model more robust to noise. Uh, and it also, and I speculate, it helps the, network, the model to explore uh, the parameter space more efficiently. Uh, but the most important is that the right kind of noise, and you can analyze that and we will analyze it shortly, the right kind of noise makes uh, our relaxed samples similar to one-hot vectors uh, so that the network will have to adjust to something that looks like one-hot and this is exactly what we need because during the test time we'll be feeding in discrete random samples the actual real one-hot vectors and we really need the network to be working well on that. So this is what I call reducing the train test mismatch. Because remember, during the test time, we uh, relax, and we do not relax during the test time. Uh, yeah, uh, and we can consider as, let's consider a special case. Uh, it's very simple to uh, consider a special case for just binary random variable here. If you have K2, you can simplify the softmax into a sigmoid and uh, come up with uh, this formula. Here, instead of a gumbel noise, we will have uh, the so-called logistic, the standard logistic noise. Uh, it's just a difference of two gumbels. There is uh, a bit more efficient way to uh, sample the logistic uh, noise so that you w would need to sample only one random variable per, per uh, discrete node rather than two if you were using the gumbel softmax, the, the, the original, the softmax formulation. This is called the uh, relaxed Bernoulli. And this is very easy to derive it is by yourself. So let's now, oh yeah, and um, what I want to notice that why I introduced this slide is because we would like to analyze what's going on here. In particular, here we have the standard logistic noise that we then shift by deterministic variable, uh, by deterministic, by some constant uh, and uh, then the transform distribution, the shifted distribution that would have uh, logistic with mean log p over 1 minus pi and uh, the unit scale, we will push this distribution through the sigmoid with the temperature. And this will determine how our relaxed samples will look like. So by looking at the distribution of uh, this, we will understand what kind of input our network uh, receives during the training and m kind of m make inferences uh, about what it might learn. So in particular, if we have uh, zero temperature, here th this big point d d denotes the zero 
uh, the x equals zero. So here, this solid line that goes from here and then drops here is denoting the step function. It's exactly the sigmoid with zero temperature. So uh, here you have on x-axis you have the probability distribution of the logits of these shifted logits. You can see uh, they are always they are everywhere the same uh, and shifted to the right because uh, the value of one is more probable than the value of zero. And uh, indeed, in in case of zero temperature, you would recover two peaks on at the points of zero and one. So the thing this works is that you take a point and take some mass with it, and then you see where this point gets mapped by this function, by this, uh, in, in this case, the step function. You take this point, it gets mapped to one. You take this point, it gets mapped to zero. So every point up to the zero itself it gets, will be mapped to zero, and every, po every positive point will be mapped to one. And, and they will transfer some probability mass with them. So you will have a peak here and a peak here. Now, now, this is uh, the discrete case that we would really like to work for. However, there is no mass in the between. So uh, you can hope to learn to work with these things uh, using the gradient descent. Uh, but if you increase the temperature, you would have less steep sigmoid. For example, here, this is a sigmoid, a bit more steep than the usual one, uh, but it has non-zero derivative everywhere. So uh, the, after the transformation, you would receive something U-shaped like this. And uh, an interesting property here is that we have modes at 1 and at 0. That is, there are two probability peaks. One is at 0, and the other one is at 1. That means that uh, the, w the, the values around this region where there is a lot of probability mass are more probable than the others. For example, here there is only a, fine, uh, only a, a little bit, uh, a little amount of m probability mass. That means th these po points from this region are unlikely to be sampled. Uh, and points from this region are kind of more likely to be sampled, uh, especially given that the mode is exactly at uh, one or uh, it's exactly at zero. That means that the closer you are to the zero, then the, the bigger the probability is that uh, you will that your relaxed sample will be one or zero. Uh, then, as you increase the probability further, the softmax be becomes less steep, more kind of uniform. So that uh, at the unit temperature, the peak at the zero completely disappears, uh, but the peak at the one remains. Uh, and if you increase the temperature all the way to the two, then both peaks at the end will disappear, and the only peak in the interior that pretty much resembles the original distribution would remain. This is not something we would like uh, to have because here most of the samples lie like in the region of uh, between 0 0.5 and probably 0 0.95, uh, whereas during the test time the network will be uh, fed with uh, zeros and ones, not something in between. So, uh, after so uh, as Professor Vetter have said, uh, this trick was uh, introduced by two independent teams from Google. Uh, and one of them uh, bothered to prove some theorems, nam namely that if you take the temperature small enough, smaller than 1 over k minus 1, then you are guaranteed to not have any modes in the interior. That is, there will be no peaks in the interior of 0, 1 interval. On the only peaks you could have are on the, uh, on the boundaries of this interval. Uh, this is certainly an appealing property. This is what uh, makes the samples contrastive. Uh, okay, but this only gives us a sort of an upper bound of the temperature. How do we actually uh, you, uh, choose the temperature? Should we anneal it? Should we just take some fixed value? Uh, unfortunately, the theory does not answer that. Uh, what However, you can notice that the small temperature uh, leads you to better approximation of the discrete 
case. Uh, well, that's obviously. However, that incurs uh, uh, high variances because uh, in the limit of zero, uh, in the limit of zero temperature, you recover the discrete case exactly, and uh, that has infinite vari variance of ingredients. Uh, but the large temperatures w will have uh, lower variance uh, for because due to the more smooth uh, behavior of the sigmoid, uh, but they will deviate from the discrete case significantly, and uh, will and that will uh, lead to losses in the approximation quality. Uh, so what people do in practice is that they just uh, use grid search over a few possible values, uh, essentially making the temperature another hyperparameter to be tuned. So in conclusion, with the Gumbels of Max trick, it just relaxes your random variables uh, from discrete case into a continuous one. Uh, in order to enable the power of free parameterization trick. However, this comes at the cost that uh, you are deviating from the actual objective, from the actual uh, mode of, uh, from, the actual, from the actual regime of work that you are really care about, and you introduce uh, unwanted biases using that. Uh, and then there is yet another uh, issue of having a temperature as a learn as a hyperparameter that you need to tune, and that is also uh, adds some computational burden upon you. Uh, there exist other methods uh, other than Gumbel softmax. However, uh, they are more hacky, uh, less mathematically elegant, uh, and uh, there is little. Mm, there, there is little evidence that they could work better uh, empirically. Uh, however, sometimes they have uh, interesting properties. For example, uh, there is uh, the so-called Gumbel softmax, uh, Gumbel straight through uh, method that, that does not require you to evaluate your network at these uh, relaxed uh, variables. Uh, it allows you to work with them. Um, Mm, with the models that do not allow you, uh, that, that do not accept relaxed uh, inputs. However, we will not cover this here. Uh, but what we will do next is that we will get back to our uh, reinforced estimate and try to reduce its variance by uh, clearly using the so called variance reduction techniques. Uh, and in particular, we will use the uh, so-called baselines, uh, the so-called control variates, uh, and we will deliver baselines from them. So the control variate is the following. So suppose we have some function b of z that has tractable expectation in the sense that you can compute the mean value of this b analytically this you can compute this expectation analytically then uh, you can come up with the following estimator for the expected value of f by just sampling uh, a mini batch of different z's and computing the difference between f and b uh, of course by just computing this term uh, you would introduce a bias into your estimate that would be no longer estimate of the expectation of f. However, this bias would be equivalent to the minus expectation of b, and you can fix that, fix this up by just adding the mu back. So, uh, however, in this form, this estimator, this estimator is not guaranteed to have reduced variance. It will only reduce variance if f and z, if f and b have sufficiently large. Uh, if f and z have a positive correlation. Uh, but if they do, then we obtain the unbiased estimator of the expectation of f. Uh, and here, b of z is called the control variate. Mm, I have no idea where the name is coming from. Uh, it's super convenient. If your b of z is zero mean, then you don't really need to add this thing. Uh, but the real interest in these methods is that uh, though 
the expectation of f is coming from the problem at hand, uh, for example, you are tasked, you have, mm, you are asked to estimate some expectation. Uh, you are free to choose whatever baseline you want, and it will not affect uh, the results you have. It will only affect the quality, their quality. So engineering, uh, so finding a good uh, B of Z is sort of like a feature engineering. It's up to you as a researcher. So uh, the intuition behind these uh, controvariates is that essentially it allows you to extract some tractable part of the signal, some tractable part of the F, and uh, a compute that analytically, and uh, then compute the rest, uh, what you couldn't compute uh, analytically, using the Monte Carlo. Uh, in, in that sense, if you really can extract something useful out of F, out of F then sure, that w should lead into a decrease in the variance. Uh, however, for reinforce, we'll be using the uh, so-called baselines uh, that are related to the controvariates, and they look uh, as this. So uh, recall that uh, mu here is the expectation of this quantity. So now, since our Q depends on phi, then the mu also starts depending on phi, and it becomes a function of phi. So uh, usually the baseline is assumed to be some simple function uh, th that you can actually uh, uh, expect over the distribution Q. Okay, so uh, this estimator Yes, uh, B here is called the baseline. Uh, essentially, this gives you a controvariate of the form BZ times uh, log gradient of the log density. Uh, sure, you could come up, I guess, with some other uh, controvariates. However, uh, I have not seen them in practice. I guess uh, working with the BZ is uh, simpler because uh, it's sort of uh, more interpretable says that uh, it sort of approximates the F. Uh, it's easy to see that this is an unbiased estimate uh, because this thing is uh, actually the reinforced estimator of the gradient of the expectation. So by subtracting that and then adding the actual gradient of the expectation, you, have, uh, you are not adding any bias. So, and if you write, choose the right B, you would have a much lower variance. For example, if you happen to be able to compute the F analytically, then you would be having here a difference of two Fs, that is zero, and then the uh, reinforced term would completely vanish, and all you would have left is, is, the, is the deterministic gradient of the objective you care about. So, so, you, or, so your reinforced estimator would be a point estimate, would be just a deterministic value of the true gradient. Uh, having zero variance, which is something we would really like to have. And the core idea, the intuition behind this method is the same. We just it extract some tractable part of our function, we compute its gradient analytically, and then uh, we fix whatever we couldn't extract uh, using the reinforce. Uh, some simple baselines that people were using a long time ago include uh, like the constant baseline. Uh, for ex if you really look at the reinforce, you could notice that uh, it's not mm, it's not invariant and under adding a constant to the function. Like here, if you don't have the baseline, you could add some constant to the f, and then you would have a slightly different uh, value of the gradient. However, that is still an unbiased estimate of the gradient. That means that uh, we can find some optimal constant to add to our function. Uh, and this is exactly what people were doing in the early days. Uh, they were calling this the optimal baseline, optimal, I guess, constant in terms of z baseline. Uh, the idea is that, okay, let's subtract some constant from here. It does not introduce any additional bias because of uh, this property. If you just expect the constant over any distribution, then the 
dependence on phi will sort of m marginalize out and all you will have just a constant which is independent of your parameters phi. So this guy is zero and all we are left is uh, this term. Now you can, what we are looking for is we are looking for a minimal variance so we can analytically write down the, uh, using the pen and paper, on the paper you can write down the expression for the variance of this guy and it will be just a simple quadratic equ uh, equation which you can minimize uh, again on the pen, uh, on the paper using the pen. Uh, you will uh, obtain the following formula. Here you have uh, some pretty complicated things like variance and variance. Uh, surely there is no hope to compute them analytically. However, you can compute them using uh, running averages uh, during the optimization. Uh, that would give you some estimate of the C. Uh, then we can take this idea a, a step further. Namely, uh, in practice, we usually don't have uh, these uh, by themselves. Uh, quite often, this is dependent on some other uh, random variable, on some other piece of data, x. In particular, consider the variation of autoencoders, maybe discrete variation of autoencoders. There, you have some data point from your training sample, and uh, you pass that through the encoder network in order to get parameters of uh, the distribution of the latent code, z. Uh, th then, uh, you, you know that z and x are somehow related, and probably uh, x has a lot of information about z. So why n not make our baseline, even though it's independent of the z, it can be dependent of the on x. Uh, this is what we are going to do. So here, instead of c, we'll be using some function of x. Of course, we, cannot, n we can no longer use this optimal formula, because that would require you to compute it for every possible x. And that is uh, certainly not going to scale. However, you can uh, pose this as a regression problem by minimizing the expected mean squared error between the your, your function the f and uh, the approximate the approximation uh, this is uh, called the anvil estimator for the paper that uh, introduced it and uh, the paper was called neuro variation of inference and learning in billet networks Okay, but th those are very simple uh, baselines. They don't really use the action. They don't really use the Z itself. They are so-called uh, they are so-called so action independent baselines. Uh, but we can do much better R nowadays. People know how to use so-called action dependent baselines. Uh, the simplest example of that uh, is the mu prop. So what we, as I said, what we want using the ba uh, when we use baselines is we want to extract some important information out of the f and then handle the rest uh, using the reinforce. Uh, this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to consider uh, Taylor expansion around some reference point z zero. Uh, for example, first order ta Taylor expansion. Then this leads us to the following formula here. Th this term compensates for the bias. This is sort of the, oh yeah, and w as the reference point, we'll take the mean value of your code, the expected value of z. Uh, and th the gradient will look like this. So when you optimi uh, compute the expected value of this term, you will only, uh, it will essentially lead to th such term. Now let's uh, look a bit closer what's going on here. So here we have our function f evalu evaluated at the mean point, at the mean latent variable, and then we backprop through this mean variable. What's interesting though is that here we're finally starting to use the gradient information of f. It is something that we seek and uh, something that we believe uh, should make a method more efficient. So in a sense, here we backpropagate to the mean version of a neural network, but then we compensate for the, of course you can't just use the mean version of your network because the network will adjust to these intermediate values. So what we do 
then is that we not only backpropagate through the mean version, but we also fix the sort of disparities, the issues introduced by such method by reinforce. This, yeah, this is what's going on. Uh, yeah, then of course one could consider the second order Taylor expansion. However, that does not uh, scale well because the evaluating the baseline, uh, the first order Taylor baseline is uh, linear in the number in the dimension of z. The gradient is linear in the dimension of z. However, if you are willing to go for the higher order approximations, uh, then the Hessian, for example, would incur the it would be quadratic in the dimension of z. Uh, then the third order uh, derivative would be cubic and so on. So if you can afford uh, this computationally, then sure, go for it. Uh, however, uh, in practice, that uh, that's quite often becomes prohibit prohibitively from the computational point of view. Uh, but the but then, okay. So so far, we used pretty simple uh, approximations: the constant, then the constant that is a function of something else. Uh, now we used the uh, Taylor expansion. Uh, but we already know uh, yet another interesting approximation and uh, quite powerful one, namely the Gumbel approximation. Uh, the Gumbel approximation uh, looks, uh, it's quite hard to, so yeah, it was introduced in the paper called the Rebar. Uh, there is an interesting uh, play in the language here. Uh, rebar is a sort of con construction material that is more, mm, that is more sound than concrete. Uh, yeah, and concrete is one of the concrete distribution is uh, one of the names of the Gumbels, uh, the other name of the Gumbels of Max distribution, uh, probably as a mm, reference to the Knuth book Concrete Mathematics. So yeah, the rebar is the, an extension of a Gumbel uh, relaxation of the concrete distribution, and uh, it sort of makes uh, makes use of. Uh, Gumbel uh, relaxation, but reduces the bias. Uh, actu actually, it uh, eliminates the bias of the Gumbel relaxation at all. It gives you an unbiased me method by combining the reinforce and uh, the Gumbels of Max. Uh, the formula looks as following. Uh, it's quite complicated, and I'm not going to describe its derivation in detail. Uh, what I would like to note, note though, is that here we have this interesting thing, uh, the relaxation that is conditioned on our sample z. Recall that in order to have any practical advantage uh, due to the introduction of the baseline, we need to these two quantities uh, to be correlated. We need the, our signal f to be positively correlated with the baseline. Here the baseline is this Ether times f uh, at the conditionally relaxed point. So this conditional relaxation is what we do in order to force uh, I is our way to enforce this positive correlation between the approximation and the original discrete uh, signal. And then uh, this term is compensating for the bias that's introduced here. So again, you can s say that uh, here we are doing backprop to the Gumbel uh, relaxed version. Uh, this is what he, this term is exactly the gradient that you would get in the reparameterized version uh, in the Gumbel softmax. Uh, but then th this term and this term fix the biases that you introduce using that method. Uh, yeah. It, it What's interesting, though, is that even though you cannot e evaluate the expectation of this uh, control variate of this baseline in order to uh, f fix for the introduced bias, uh, we can. Uh, it, it is tractable in a different sense, and it's it is tractable in a sense that it is reparameterizable. You can write down the expectation of that, and uh, by manipulating some formulas and uh, use of the reparameterization you come up with uh, the with this objective uh, with this gradient and uh, the, it turns out that this objective is uh, completely reparameterizable 
uh, here we sort of ignore the dependence of z on the phi. Uh, and uh, in, instead of computing the, d d uh, the actual expectation, here we're using the reparameterized re stochastic gradients. Yeah, this is uh, this is the important, the most important thing, is that you don't really need to, you don't always need to compute the expectation itself. You just need to be able to compute the gradients more efficiently than you do using the reinforce. Okay, and then uh, another interesting topic here is the variance minimization. So recall that uh, the only reason for the baselines is that we want to minimize the variance. We only introduce the variance, the baselines, in order to reduce the variance of the results in gradient estimator. So why not? Uh, and, and we already seen how, d in the case of the constant baseline, we can analytically minimize the variance. So maybe we can minimize the variance in this case as well. For example, in the Gumbel's of Max baseline in the rebar, we have uh, here in the relaxation we have some temperature parameter and there is also this ETA parameter for some reason. So uh, how, how do we choose this? Are these also hyperparameters? But maybe, maybe we can optimize them in order to minimize the variance of the results in estimator of this estimator. This is another interesting idea that was proposed in the original paper on the rebar and then further exploit it in a next in the follow up paper called the uh, where the author proposed it in, where, okay, in some other paper the interesting idea here is that okay so suppose we want to minimize this the variance with respect to parameters tau and eta the temperature and the scaling factor then this variance uh, we can rewrite the variance that is the difference of the second moment and the square of the first moment uh, what's cool here is that this second moment is completely independent of the baselines. This is just the expectation of your gradients, and your gradients are unbiased. I mean, we only care about reinforce because it gives you unbiased gradients, and here it's just the expectations of them. So here you have the true gradient, and it is completely independent, independent on any baselines you have introduced. So when we are minimizing the variance with respect to baselines, with respect to baselines parameters, we only care about uh, this guy, this term, and it has, uh, so, yeah. Uh, it's also important that our uh, gradient estimate is unbiased, because in general, minimizing variance leads to increase in bias. Uh, for example, if you were minimizing the variance of the usual Gumbels of max relaxation, you would inevitably uh, increase the bias and uh, everything would, broke, would break. Uh, but this is not the case because here we have embedded procedure of the D, uh, bias uh, of the unbiasing. We are automatically unbiasing our estimate. So essentially, in order to learn optimal tau and eta, all we need is to minimize the squared norm uh, you know, in, our ca if in case of the gradient, uh, in case of the vector gradient, we minimize the squ squared R L2 norm of the gradient, uh, ex expect it over all possible z's. Uh, now we can easily do stochastic optimization here because this expectation does not depend on tau or eta. They are, again, just baseline parameters. And uh, you can push the gradient with respect to tau or eta through the expectation in order to obtain gradients with respect to tau and eta, and then apply the usual variance reduction, uh, the usual stochastic optimization uh, methods, like Adam or any, uh, any other method you'd like. Uh, but then you can take this idea even further. So why do we optimize in? Why are we learning over only the temperature and the scaling factor ether uh, when we could learn anything? There is no limitation in uh, what parameters of the baseline we should be learning. 
This is uh, the interesting observation made by the authors of, the, of this paper called the backpropagation to the void, where they suggested that, okay, so why do we even care about the fixed baseline? Why don't we learn the whole baseline from the scratch? Uh, we could say that our baseline is another neural network that takes, that receives the relaxed samples and we are optimizing it by minimizing the variance of this estimator, of the rebar estimator. Then here we would have some function j, here we would have the same j, and here, and so it's only that for the baseline we would need to evaluate this relaxed, this mm, another baseline j, uh, and the and f would be only accepting, would be only working on the uh, on the discrete samples. So, having done this, having gone for a, uh, for a relaxed, for a learnable baseline, we're essentially achieving the ability, we have the ability to work with the models that do not uh, accept uh, relaxed inputs. For example, in the rebar, we had to put and the F had to work with the relaxed uh, inputs, whereas the in the case of the baseline, F does not have to, uh, with the case with the fully learnable baseline, the F does not have to uh, work on these relaxed inputs. That allows us to use the method in settings like uh, reinforcement learning, where we don't know the function, uh, the reward function exactly, uh, and uh, gives this uh, method a great generality. So I, I guess uh, th this is uh, kind of state of the art in discrete uh, latent variable learning, and it's uh, it's a good candidate to close the whole problem uh, as uh, to mark the whole problem as a solved one. Uh, now we just uh, need to see for the mm, more wider uh, adoption by the practitioners, by the people who actually train such models. So this is a definitely uh, great advancement. Okay, so it's time to conclude. Uh, there are, we, we considered three parts. Uh, so first we recall the reinforce estimator and uh, we discovered that it's, it has poor performance and large variance, probably due to the fact that it does not use the gradient of the function it's optimizing the phi, the f. Uh, However, uh, so in order to, in attempt to fix that, we try to come up with a method uh, that's using the reparameterization, the reparameterization trick, uh, they call the Gumbels of Max. Uh, it works uh, well in practice. Uh, it's kind of straightforward to implement. You just uh, locally replace the discrete uh, sampling layer with a, re a relaxed layer and uh, for example, in TensorFlow, there are drop-in replacements that allow you to do the stuff without care, uh, without really caring what's going on under the hood. Uh, however, it has some hyperparameters that needs to be tuned, and uh, it's introducing some discrepancies, some bias between your train and test performance. And it might be the case that. Uh, for some re really complicated models, uh, you'll have hard time tuning this uh, model uh, to minimize the train test mismatch. And then we also considered the variance reduction methods that try to fix the problems we discovered in the reinforced method. Uh, they are m the, the most advanced ones, like the rebar and relax, are quite complicated. Uh, it's not actually. It's actually not that much clear whether the results are at now. Uh, right now, it's not clear whether uh, they, they resu the results they are achieving is worth the additional computational burden that they uh, bring. For example, in the uh, well, in these papers, authors say that they can learn variation of autoencoders much more efficiently in terms of the training loss. They, they can s efficiently overfit. However, this uh, these improvements do not necessarily translate in the to a better test performance. So uh, maybe this sort of closes the problem with the, uh, 
poor optimization methods and opens the problem for the efficient uh, regularization techniques. Uh, the, the good thing about the variance, re the variance reducted methods s is that they are always unbiased and uh, this unbiasedness compared with the uh, variance minimization techniques allows you to tune some hyperparameters, uh, tune your baselines and uh, kind of get some op uh, really optimal baselines, optimal uh, with uh, the optimal baselines that actually use uh, actions use uh, these. So I guess uh, we can conclude that uh, th all these methods make uh, this random search reinforce more like a random search on steroids. Uh, oh yeah, and I should notice that uh, this is still uh, an ongoing topic of research. There are many more methods published every day uh, and there are many other approaches I didn't uh, cover for various reasons. So uh, there are some links uh, in the in the rest slides, so if you are interested, you can read this. Uh, also, I hope that uh, I guess uh, the real rebar and the relax will be covered in tomorrow's uh, lecture by the professor Wailing. So uh, I guess uh, he'll go in the more details than I did. Uh, and now I'm ready to answer all of your questions. Okay. I can repeat it. On which problems were these techniques tested? Uh, okay, so the question is... Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so the question is, uh, what problems did people test these methods on? So my major interest is uh, discrete variation of autoencoders when we're talking about these models. So m the most common test bench is the discrete variation of autoencoders. Uh, there are several different architectures that people use. This is more of a standard uh, workbench. Uh, then there were some, I guess especially uh, for the Goombel softmax, it was used for some other methods. I guess I seen someone actually using an LSTM where they replaced the uh, soft gates, the sigmoid gates with the uh, Goombel softmax. And they reported that there, uh, they had some uh, increase in the accuracy. Uh, so th there are ver there are various uh, models, but the standard workbench is the discrete variation of autoencoder. Uh, you mentioned that there are techniques to do, do the relaxations, like to to work with discrete variables when f cannot accept uh, continuous values. Can you? Elaborate. Yeah, sure. Well, out of the methods that I covered here, uh, the last one, the uh, well, I guess the last one, the uh, relax uh, that we got. So here, uh, if you actually learn your baseline, you can work with f that d cannot uh, that cannot work with the relaxed uh, inputs. For example, maybe maybe you want to. Uh, you want to learn a model that generates programs. And then your F essentially is a compiler that compiles your program and maybe runs a battery of tests. Then, of course, this uh, compiler cannot uh, accept something relaxed, something that has uh, 0.5 of 4 and 0.4 of if and 0.1 of, uh, uh, of some other statement. So uh, out of the methods I covered here, th this one, uh, when you actually learn your baseline, uh, w would work because yeah, it would not require you to put these relaxed samples into the F. Uh, then there is also Anvil uh, that, uh, well, the simple methods that don't use the actions at all, they would work also. Uh, the Goombels of Max would not work. And then there are many other methods that just say that, okay, let's uh, run the forward pass as usual, just sampling discrete random variables. But during the backward pass, we pretend that we actually sampled a relaxation. So these methods usually have uh, 
they are incorrect from the mathematical point of view. Their gradients do not correspond to anything. Uh, but uh, the people use them uh, because, they, well, the people mostly were using them a long time ago when they didn't have uh, powerful methods like, uh, like now. Uh, but uh, this is uh, an option if you're willing to trade um, mathematical correctness for, um, for some results. More questions? About temperature in uh, Gumball Softmax. Um, F first, uh, how we tune it? Uh, which uh, which metric do we use? Uh, and uh, second, why can't we just change model and add uh, temperature as uh, other parameters? Okay, so there are two questions. Both are related to the Gumbels of Max. Oh, I guess uh, everyone's heard about your question. Okay, so I will not repeat it then. Uh, so th the first question regarding the temperature. Uh, we, y y there is no w way to sort of automatically choose the temperature. You do a grid search and uh, you just look at the task specific metric you have. If you are doing, if you are learning the variant, uh, if, you are, if you are trying to learn variant, uh, variational autoencoders, then you're looking for the log likelihood on the test data. Uh, if you're trying to learn the uh, hard attention model for your uh, classification network, then you look at the classification uh, accuracy at the test data and so on. Well, of course, uh, in this case, uh, that would be validation data. Uh, and the second question regarding the, uh, the sort of free parameterization is that, well, y you could uh, sort of optimize over the temperature, do a gradient descent over a temperature. However, that does not guarantee you that the, it will, that the results in gradient estimate would be any close to the true gradient, uh, that y you can incur very large biases by uh, doing optimization over the temperature in the case of Gumbel softmax, because it's not guaranteed to be unbiased. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, when we optimize the temperature as a hyperparameter, we are looking at the some. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess. Uh, well, usually the metrics you are really looking for are very hard to uh, optimize directly, like the uh, classification accuracy. This is uh, not something you can optimize using the gradient descent. Uh, the log likelihood is also hard to estimate, uh, and uh, th then also, so when we are looking at the validation quality, we are running our networks in the discrete regime. We are sampling discrete samples instead of the uh, continue instead of the relaxations. Uh, and this, this is where there are no temperatures already. All the temperatures uh, have been have left our problem. Hi, thank you for a nice talk. My question is uh, regarding the application. Sylvia Richardson and uh, Leonardo Bottle at Cambridge a few years ago successfully implemented Bayesian variable selection procedure in linear models by means of introducing uh, discrete latent uh, indicators switching on and off different variables and using spike and slap priors on different weights for these linear models. And then using uh, variational inference for uh, evaluating of the posteriors of interest. Have there been any attempts of introducing some discrete uh, indicators for switching off and on weights in deep neural networks? Uh, and using the same spike uh, and slap priors for the param parameters, right? And uh, do you think this might be successful? Uh, okay, so uh, Professor Wetterf, during uh, the end of his lecture, he mentioned uh, the paper called Discrete Variational Autoencoders. 
uh, that paper was a bunch of different techniques, different methods in order to get a decent state of the art result on uh, generative modeling from NIST, the standard workbench for uh, the test bench for the uh, discrete VIE. And this paper uh, was actually using something like spike and slab priors, uh, spike and slab distributions. Uh, however, uh, for some reason, uh, this idea did not uh, pick up. Uh, it was not picked up by the research community. Probably it was kind of hard for people to digest and uh, mm, sort of, it's the, so since the paper had a lot of different tricks uh, used, it's hard to tell what exactly led to the increase uh, in the quality, whether it was a more complicated architecture or maybe it was the trick they proposed. So, yeah. Other questions? So if no, then thank you for the attendance. And uh, uh, I guess let's go for a coffee break.